Do you want to understand experimental research design? Are you thinking of venturing into experimental research? Do you have some sort of concerns of how to get into it? Or do you get scared of the terminologies used in experimental research design? If you have an answer of yes to any of these questions, stay tuned and the next video is going to explain the basics of experimental research design. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, perfect. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whatever time zone you guys are watching from. My name is Faizan Ali. I'm an assistant professor and graduate program coordinator at the College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership, University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee. Um, for some of you who are on my Facebook, you know that I'm running a channel on YouTube called Research Beast. And as part of that channel, I invite different scholars to talk about different type of research methods. Uh, today's talk will be about experimental research design. The idea came from um, a panel that we did a few months back uh, about experimental research. And that was simply a panel. We got a good response for that panel, but I also got messages from different people asking to do another webinar on basics of experimental research design for people who have never used this method before or who are thinking to venture into this method. So um, this talk today will be part of that panel, an extension of that panel, and we'll be talking about basics of experimental research design. A little bit about myself. Um, I am... Um, as I said, I'm an assistant professor. I got my job at USF in 2016. Prior to my job, I was a postdoctoral scholar at Florida State University. My PhD is in marketing from Malaysia. My master's is from UK. I'm from Pakistan, so my bachelor's is from Pakistan. Um, I've done quite a lot of research. Um, and my research area is basically consumer behavior and hospitality and tourism. And I also work with advanced statistics and structural equation modeling. Um, a little bit more about what I do uh, in, as my service to um, uh, hospitality research. Um, I am vice president for sex of federation under ICRI. I'm also director of research methods and statistics for ANAHE. Uh, I'm involved with multiple journals in hospitality and tourism and also in business and services marketing. I serve on multiple hospitality and services journal editorial boards. And one thing that I like to do is talk to emerging scholars at workshops that I conduct in conferences and in different universities. So far, I have uh, conducted more than 40 workshops in different countries and I've uh, talked to more than 2,000 participants and I feel very lucky to do that. It also gives me access to many emerging scholars and many established scholars like the two scholars that are going to talk today. Uh, so today's session, um, which I'm going to talk very quickly about, but before that, um, all this stuff that I do, many people ask me if I do some fun stuff as well. Yes, I do, and I do a lot of fun stuff that keeps me sane. I love adventures, uh, hiking, skydiving, trail rides, and stuff like that. Um, I travel a lot. It inspires me. I'm a big-time foodie. I like, love eating, and I enjoy cooking sometimes. Uh, I'm a huge fan of nature, so I have had a lot of different animals as pets and plants. So some pictures to prove that I am not lying. Um, here we go. Uh, all right, and then, uh, so this takes me to my uh, next slide, and that is a little introduction about Research Beast. It's a YouTube channel. Um, here's a QR code, so if you are not subscribed to the channel, I would really encourage you subscribing to the channel, uh, which would give you access to many interesting videos on different type of research methods. Um, this is how the homepage would look like, and some of the videos that I have done on this channel are uh, here. Uh, so far, I have uploaded 14 videos. There are more than 2,200 subscribers um, with, a with more than 30,000 views and it's watched around 100,000 minutes. Um, some of the videos that can be interesting for researchers are here. So I don't want to read all of these titles, but you can just go through them and see whatever is good for you. Um, all right, uh, the last slide. 
is uh, this introduction to today's session. I already talked about the title, which is Basics of Experimental Research Design. Um, two very uh, interesting scholars, upcoming scholars, and very established scholars. I mean, they have published extensively. Dr. Shi Leong, she is from University of North Texas. I know her since 2015 uh, when um, uh, we met at some conference and then after that she has contributed almost to every special issue that I have worked with, um, whether it was PLS, whether it was research methods, and um, now she is working with experimental research as well. Um, and then Dr. Lori Wu, she is my Facebook friend for quite a long time, but I met her for the first time last month, uh, face to face. Uh, Dr. Lori Wu is trained by one of the most prominent scholars in experimental research design in hospitality and tourism, Dr. Anna Matilla. And Dr. Lori is currently at Temple University. Uh, both of them were very gracious and uh, I'm very thankful for, to both of them for accepting my invitation to do this webinar. Um, I am the moderator. I don't know what am I going to moderate because both of them are really good at what they talk. Uh, but it's time for us to start and uh, I think we are going to keep it sweet and short, short and sweet, uh, maybe 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And then if you have any questions, since we have a problem connecting to YouTube, um, I'm live on Facebook and I'm also going to upload the video on YouTube later on. If you have any questions, uh, please post the questions in the comment section below in on Facebook live and we'll try to get the answers for your questions towards the end of the session. All right, so um, this is all that I have to say. Uh, uh, Cece or Lori, do you guys have any questions before we start? No. No? All right, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then uh, Cece, you are going to share your screen, and I guess Lori is going to talk first, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay. Okay, here you go, Laurie. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so today, thank you, Dr. Ali, once again for extending this invitation uh, to Dr. Cici Leon and, uh, and myself to do this little webinar on Introduction to Experimental Method in Hospitality Research. Uh, both of us have known Dr. Ali for a long time, and I have been a long-term fan on YouTube as well as on Facebook uh, to Dr. Ali's great work. So thank you very much for this opportunity for to provide us this opportunity for us to talk about experimental methods and the basics and to discuss and learn together. Um, so to begin with, we have a, a little agenda for today's talk as it's going to be short and sweet, um, 30 minutes, and we have quite some items to cover. So we will begin with the webinar uh, with myself talking about type of research, what experiment and types of experiment. And then following that, Dr. Liang is going to give a more detailed look into the how aspect of experiment, meaning the definition, the terms and the designs, the statistical test, and towards the end, some tips will also be provided. So to begin, what is research? So I guess to ask that question, everybody's response will be like, what do you mean, what is research? We're all nerds here. Hopefully we're not only nerds uh, talking about research and research is our job. But also when we're talking about research, we have to be, be aware that there are different types of research and there are different paradigms of research. While research in general is a process to discover new knowledge, it's a cons careful consideration, a systematic inquiry to describe to explain or to predict or even to control an observed phenomenon, there are also different types of research and there are different ways for us to, reach, uh, to approach a research phenomenon. So for instance, in general, we will say there are three different types of research, each with its own goals, pros and cons. And we will typically talk that there are descriptive type of research, where for, uh, for instance, maybe a market researcher wants to understand, create a snapshot of the current state of the market environment. So in that way, a descriptive research would be a very good approach for us to provide a relatively complete picture of what is going on. But however, it does not really assess relationships among specific constructs or variables. And in addition to that, it's very general and it's probably uh, very um, restricted in that term. 
Now, the second type of research is typically correlational research, where we try to explain relationships among different types of variables, and so that we can potentially predict with some restriction of future events from our knowledge of the present and of the past. This approach of research, this type of research, would allow us to test expected relationships between and among variables. But however, we cannot draw causal inferences about the relationships among variables, as sometimes we do not know what variable occurs first, and therefore causal relationships cannot be inferenced. The third type, which is the focus of today's talk, is causal experimental research. So this approach of research, our main goal here is to explore the causal inference or causal impact of one or more factor variable on a result variable or an effect factor. This approach would allow us to draw conclusions about causal relationships among variables. But however, as we will discuss further soon, um, sometimes experimental manipulation at the same, while being very strong in internal validity, may risk limit us in terms of generalizing our findings, and that will limit us in terms of external validity. Just show some examples. So, for instance, when we're talking about descriptive research, a typical example would be a marketer. Okay, for instance, a business hotel would want to gather some preliminary information about the demographic profile of their business customers. So this is purely descriptive in nature. We're just trying to describe what is going on. Now, second type, a uh, second example, a consulting group wants to investigate how customers' health consciousness level correlates with their fast food restaurant frequency rate. So this way, we have two variables, clearly, and we want to test a certain type of correlational relationship between them. But however, even with some sort of correlation relationship coexisting there, we cannot conclude to say that it is health consciousness level that is inferencing for, uh, fast food restaurant frequency rate by itself. It is very likely that these two variables, they go on in a vicious relationship, meaning that maybe it's the fast food restaurant frequency late, what rate will later also influence their health consciousness level. And therefore, it's more correlational by nature. Now, the third part is a typical example of experimental research, where a theme park or resort wants to test and compare the effects of two new advertising themes. Okay, so they have developed two different versions of advertisements and they want to see which one might be able to draw better attention to draw higher levels of sales of their vacation packages. So that in the industry, sometimes we will also call experiment uh, as an A-B testing, meaning you're comparing two, um, two effects and try to see their results to see which one is better. Now, causal research, as we showed in the example earlier, we're trying to investigate the relationship of a cause and effect relationship, okay? So sometimes, for example, something happens and then that would be our cause, okay? But meanwhile, what kind of results does it draw on? That will be the things, the effect, things that happen as a result of the cause, okay? For instance, um, Maybe my son wants to go out and play, okay, but however, the weather is not in its best mood and all of a sudden it's a thunder there and because of that cause, the fact could be that he's not so happy at the moment and he would more, probably want some TV time. Next page. So when we're talking about causal research, it is very important to understand the main goal of experimental research in revealing causal relationships is that correlation is not causality. And a classic example is that in the 18th century, some, uh, there is a classic phenomenon in the 19th century, so, uh, excuse me, in Germany. There's a classic study revealing that there is a positive correlation between the number of storks and the number of newborn babies. Okay? And, but however, such a correlation does not necessarily mean that there is necessarily a causal relationship between these two variables. And sometimes we we will be able to review statistical associations or correlations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one variable is an explanation, a causal explanation to another. There could be additional relationships. There could be, it could be the Y that is influencing X. In addition to that, there could be another variable, Z, that is producing relationship to both variables, and that is why it's causing correlation between them. 
According to the causation rules, in order for you to establish a causal relationship between two variables, you have to first of all, in order for you, uh, you have to first of all establish evidence of association between X and Y, so that you know that there is some sort of relationship. But however, in addition to that, there are additional rules that you need to abide by. Second, you have to try to provide some evidence that there's condition of time order of occurrence, meaning in order for you to say that X is a cause, Y is the effect, you have to demonstrate that L manipulate, that X occurred before Y. And the third one is absence of competing causal relationships. So that, that means you need to control other causal factors and rule out confounding variables. So the latter two is probably what we want to most focus on in experimental research. With the second one, many times we manipulate the independent variable or the causal factor of X and then to test the results to see the change in Y. So for instance, as the uh, example showed before earlier, when we talk about the two different versions of TV advertisements, we want to see that the TV ads were run first, and then time, sometime later, there's some sort of change in the sales of vacation packages. Now, in addition to that, we want to provide some evidence of the causal mechanisms or the explanations in between X and Y. And many times, even with a TV ad, how does that drive sales? It could be that it's really humorous, it's really fun, or it could be that it's really providing some new information. There are multiple different types of processes under there explaining such a relationship between X and Y. So for further information, I believe that Dr. Ali has a special uh, episode um, on uh, process uh, mechanisms or moderator mediations. So probably you want to add a link somewhere over here and for people who are interested to check that out. So that uh, tool, that method by itself will be able to for you to provide some process evidence on the causal relationships underlying X and Y. In addition to that, if you're able to uh, have some control, you're able to um, show to rule out confounding variables by having clear control of the, uh, the experiment and so that you can roll other potential confounding factors at the equal level so that you can potentially roll out other explanations. And that, so that it means an experiment. What is it? An experiment by definition is a study of cause and effect and it diffic it's different from the traditional or other non-experimental methods in that it deliberately manipulates one or more variables and trying to keep all variables constant to see the results change on one or more variables measured. So that typically we would manipulate several variables ahead of time and then we want to measure its effect, of, uh, its effect or its change on the outcome variables um, towards the end. In addition, there are different types of experiments. We have lab experiment, and we have field experiment, and we have natural experiment. Lab experiment is typically where you call students or other participants to a very finely controlled environment to a lab setting, and then you have very clear control in the room as they are with you, they are on site, you have very um, very strong control, precise control of independent variables. But however, such approach potentially means that you probably have relatively low ecologic validity, especially as compared to field experiment or natural experiment. A, nat a field experiment, on the other hand, you would be able to manipulate the independent variables, but then instead of having it in a finely controlled lab experiment where you have control over everything, the music, the smell, the, the scent and everything, now you can put it in a real life setting, maybe a real restaurant, and so that you can, you're more likely to reflect real life situation in the study setting. But however, that potentially means maybe you would have less control over independent variables. In addition to that, there are also rare cases where researchers would have uh, such treasure to access the opportunity of a natural experiment. For instance, sometimes there are cities where it's naturally divided into certain districts, and while certain district policies remain unchanged, other districts' tourism policies get changed so that you would get to compare and see whether tourism policy change has an influence on various different aspects of the tourism ecological system. So that way, that means the whatever of change happening to the independent variable is naturally happening. 
that means potentially you would have no control over the independent variable as it is a natural process of currents. It does reflect real life, has very high ecological validity. But however, this is also a very rare case and we want to be aware that it's very expensive and time-wise it's also very consuming. And it potentially also means you probably would have very little or to even no control over the independent variables. If that said, that means that for different approach of experiments, just within experiments, okay, these three different type of experiments or different approach of experiments potentially have some sort of trade-off between internal validity and external validity. So it really depends on the type of research question that you are asking and also depends on your resources as well as your access to the setting, to the environment, so that you would have to have a conscientious uh, a conscious and just choice and to seek for the balance between the two. In addition, my last slide, we just want to give you a general overview of where experiments stands um, among various different types of research paradigms and methods in social science research. As you can see, according to Runkle and McGrath's uh, uh, classical circumplex model, and some of the research methods are more obtrusive by nature, meaning that you actually have vivid interventions and obtruding uh, the participants' life and behaviors. Some of the research methods will result in exploration and findings of particular behavioral systems, while some of the research methods are more universal by nature, really, uh, revealing findings. Experiments typically would stand somewhere that is more particularly focused on more particular behavior systems, if it's field experiments specifically. It's more obtrusive, meaning you have specific manipulation of variables so that you are making some changes in your participants. On the, in the, on the other hand, there is also difference um, among different types of experiments. Some of them may be more focused, more generalizable. Okay, more controlled, more refined, and therefore their findings more focused on universal behavioral phenomenon, while some of them is probably more particular, it's more restricted by field settings. And give that said, that's ending my part of the presentation, and let me present you our best, Dr. C.C. Liang from University of Texas, North Texas. Thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, so next, I am going to continue to with uh, explaining experiment terms, experiment design, and also some basics of statistic test of the experiment. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at some of the experiment terms. The first set of terms we have is independent variable and dependent variable. We do use independent variable and dependent variable in correlational research, but in experimental design, it is different in that independent variable is what we can control or what we manipulate. Well, the dependent variable is what we observe or what we uh, measure. So we already know what independent variable is in our experimental design. For example, a very simple example here, uh, if we want to use an experimental design to test folk, folk wisdom to um, eat cheese, a folk wisdom eating cheese shortly before going to bed gives people nightmares. How do we test these folk wisdom? If we want to use an experiment to test it, we'll uh, have two group of people. For one group of people, we give them cheese, a certain quant quantity of cheese, a standard time before they go into bed. And the other group of people will not eat cheese before going to the bed. And then we will count the number of the nightmares reported by the two groups. So in this case, the independent variable is cheese consumption and the dependent variable is the number or the frequency of night nightmares. So we already know that our independent variable for each participant. This is what the experimental design is different from correlational design. And the second term we have here is called conditions. Conditions is different values or levels of independent variable. So in experimental design, we have two different conditions. One is called experimental condition. That is the group who receives the treatment. 
And the other is called control condition, which is the group that doesn't receive the treatment. So in our cheese experiment, we have two conditions, one control condition, the group does not does not eat cheese before going to bed. And we also have one experimental condition, that's the group who eat cheese before going to bed. So please, um, I want you to be aware that we may have one or more experimental conditions in one experiment. So for example, in that cheese experiment, we may also want to test whether American cheese or uh, pepper jack cheese gives people more, brings people more nightmares. So we can have two experimental conditions. One group of people eat American cheese and the other group of people eat pepper jack cheese. And the second thing I want you to be aware of is some experiments don't have the control condition. For example, uh, the one Laurie just mentioned, the TV commercials, that one doesn't have any uh, control condition. So you are just basically comparing two different uh, TV commercials, how they, how they are effective. So if you are only um, interested in two different experimental conditions, you don't have to have a control condition in experiment. And the next term we have here is hypothesis. And again, we also have hypothesis developed in our correlational experiment. In, but in experiment, we, have, we can develop our hypothesis in three different ways. So first is the non-hypothesis, which basically we assume that our IV does not affect our DV, or there's no difference on DV between the conditions. And second, we can also uh, develop our hypothesis as experimental hypothesis, where we assume there will be a difference between the conditions. There are two ways for us to develop our hi uh, experimental hypothesis. One way is called directional, in which we assume one condition is better than the other. And the other way to develop experimental hypothesis is non-directional. Well, we, we don't know, we, we assume there are difference, um, but we don't know which one is better. So for our cheese experimental, uh, cheese experiment example, if we want to develop a hypothesis as non-hypothesis, we can say eating cheese does not change the likelihood of experiencing nightmares. If we want to develop it as a directional experimental hypothesis, we can say eating cheese increases the likelihood of exper experiencing nightmares. So we know the condition eating cheese, cheese is better than the condition not eating cheese. The other option to develop the hypothesis as non-directional, we can say eating cheese changes the likelihood of experiencing nightmares. But we don't know which one is worse, like eating cheese has more nightmares or not eating cheese has more, more nightmares. We don't know. So there are three different ways to develop experiment hypothesis. And how you want to develop it de depends on the literature review and also maybe the uh, journal requirement. The next term we have in uh, experiment is called manipulation. Manipulation is the term used to describe control, our control over the independent variable to cause change in the experiment. There are two types of manipulation. One is direct manipulation, which we modify the physical settings. So our cheese experiment is using direct manipulation because for one group, we give them cheese and the other group, we not give them cheese. So that's physical change. And the other uh, manipulation is called indirect manipulations, or sometimes we can also call it as instructional manipulations. That's how we changed our verbal instruction or sometimes written instruction to indirectly manipulate in, um, independent variables. That is because 
Sometimes the independent variables cannot be manipulated directly. For example, if we are using some, um, if we are using people's stress level as our independent level, independent variable, there's no way you can directly manipulate the stress level. You don't know how the people's stress level look like. So what we can do is we can give them some verbal instruction. Um, for example, we're telling them that they have five minutes to prepare a short speech that they will have to give to a big audience. So in that, um, in that way, we try to increase that group's stress level. So this comes to the question that, oh, whether their stress level um, really increased or not, that means when we use indirect manipulation, we have to always do a manipulation check, which is a test or a little survey, some items for people to fill out after the experiment to ask about their stress level. So it can be three items or four items um, with likelihood scale to ask about how stressed they feel. And what we do is after, after that, we will compare the stress level between the two groups. If they are significantly different, that means our manipulation is successful and we can continue comparing our dependent variable. If that's not significantly um, significant, if, if that's not significantly different, that means your manipulation is failed and you have to think about a different manipulation. Next, we are going to talk about experimental design. Specifically, we want to talk about how you assign the participants into different conditions. There are three ways we can assign people into different conditions. First is called within subjects, and some books or some uh, articles may, may call it as repeated measures or related samples. They are all the same thing. In this uh, design, we, each participant is tested under all conditions. So if we still use that cheese experiment as example, we will have only one group of people, like 20 people, and in the first week, we will give them cheese to eat before they go into bed. And then in the second week, we will not give them cheese before they go into bed. And then we collect the frequency of nightmares they have in two weeks and then compare. So one big problem with these within subjects design is the order effects, which is an effect of being tested in one condition on participant behavior in later conditions. So in our cheese example, or the cheese experiment example, that means if we give them cheese in the first week, they, they didn't have good sleep. Let's say they did not have any, they don't have good sleep in the first week, that may have a delayed effect in their second week sleep, so they won't sleep as well as usual. So that's ordered effects. The way we have to deal with ordered effects is called counterbalancing. So that is how we test the different participants in different orders. So in our cheese experiment example, for the 20 people, we can divide them into two groups and one group of people eat cheese in first week and not eat cheese next week. And the other group of people, they will not eat cheese in the first week and then eat cheese in the second week. With this counterbalancing method, we can uh, kind of counterbalance that order effect. So when we combine all the um, people together, then the, the results will have, will, may only be affected by the, by the uh, independent variable. The second type of experimental design is called between subject, or sometimes it's also called as independent measures or unrelated samples. So in this design, each participant is tested in only one condition. In other words, or for example, um, in our cheese experiment, 
this time we have to, we will have two group people each group has 20 people and the uh, the first group eat cheese uh, and then the second group not eating cheese and we are comparing their nightmares in the same week a big problem with between subject is the individual differences so we know we are now comparing two group of people and they are definitely different right everybody is a different individual so there might be individual difference that cause systematic bias so for example maybe in one group we already have people that have sleeping problems and the, in the other group that we have people we have people that always sleep very well so that individual difference will cause bias into and will cause change in our results so the way we try to deal with this individual difference is called randomization. Randomization is a key concept in experimental design, which I will talk about it again in my last slide. So random, uh, randomization is we try to random, uh, randomly assign our participants into two groups. So uh, I want you to aware that Random assignment is not random sampling. So you can still do convenient sample and recruit 40 people. But however, in these 40 people, you want to randomly assign them into two groups. So one rule of thumb in psychology experimental design is that when you design an experiment, you should first, you should always start by exploring their possibility of using related samples or within subjects design. The reasons, two reasons. First, you want to minimize the impact of individual differences. Again, in within subjects, because you are using the same group of people under two conditions, so there's no individual difference. Individual differences will not be an issue. And the second of all is to save cost because always between subjects will require more sample size than within subjects. So in our sleep experiment, if we do within subjects, it's only 20 people. But if we do the um, between subjects, we need 40 people. So it's an additional cost to, to recruit more people. And a good way uh, in between within subjects and between subjects design is called matching. Matching is a design that well we match our participants and assign them to conditions so that there is an equal spread of ability on the experimental task between the conditions. So in our sleep or cheese experiment, we can um, we can match the, our participants into sleep well group and the sleep not well group and then equally assign them into two conditions. And one thing you have to aware here is you need to assign your matched participants randomly. So let's say we have all the pairs when we match them and you, you don't want to assign all A's in one group and all B's in the other group. You want to do A, B, A, B randomly into two groups. Next, we are going to talk about the sample size in the experiment. A very, very rough rule of thumb is you need 20 participants per condition. This is a very rough rule of thumb. So in, if you want a better experiment design, if you want a better methodology, you probably want to consider to use a statistical software um, the G Power 3.3, 3.1. The G Power is a small software free you can download it online and then install that. And in G Power, you can use, um, if you try to do an ANOVA or MANOVA, you can pick the F test and you just give, um, a, assign a significant level alpha and a desired power. And um, uh, usually I pick medium effect size. And when you put in all these three variables, it will tell you what is the required sample size you need. This is just a screenshot of G-Power software. 
And this the next, how do you do the statistical testing in experiment? A very common method is to do ANOVA or MANOVA or even simply like t-test if you only have two groups and one dependent variable. However, sometimes you may have categorical independent variable and also categorical dependent variable. So for example, our um, the cheese experiment example, then you have to use the chi-square as your stati statistical test. And if you have numerical independent variable and also numerical dependent variable. For example, you have a moderator like the motivation or personality, those you use Likert scale to measure. Then you probably want to use process, which is a regression based soft uh, tool to do your statistical testing. The last thing I'm going to talk about is about the effect size and power. You may hear this two words in experimental design. And it is very important in experimental design that psychology actually now require people to report the effect size and power in any of their publications. So what is effect size? Effect size is magnitude of the difference between conditions in an experiment. So that is how big the difference is. And Cohen in 1969 proposed a reference to the effect, uh, to the effect size. So he said large effect size is uh, larger than 0 0.4, medium is, is um, between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, and small is between 0 0.25 to, um, and 0 0.1. And he also assumed that in psychology, effect sizes are typically small or medium. It is the same in hospitality since we are both studying human behaviors. If you are using SPSS, a partial etter square is the effect size measure uh, they use in ANOVA. So for example, if you have partial error square equals 0.16, that means 16% of the overall variance of your dependent variable is attributable to the manipulation of your independent variable. And the next is the power. What is power? Power is the capacity of experiment to correctly reject the null hypothesis or the chance of detecting an effect of independent variable on dependent variable. Power is measured on a scale from zero to one. So the more powerful the experiment, the smaller the effect size it can detect. So we always want to design a powerful experiment, as powerful as possible, so we can figure out or detect the very small differences in between conditions. Uh, there are a couple ways to increase the power, but three ways I mentioned here is realistic. Some of them is not realistic. Uh, first, how we can uh, increase power is we can increase the number of participants. And the second is we can use a related sample design the, uh, within subject design. So we um, exclude or rule out the individual difference. And the third thing is to increase the significant level. For example, make the alpha equals 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.05. Actually, in marketing studies, it's very common to see the alpha equals 0 0.1. So the last slide I have here is where well, I want to give you some tips in experimental design. So if you are interested in experiment, you want to listen to these tips. So first thing is there is no such thing as the right way to design an experiment. So there usually will be several ways, maybe many good ways to design a experiment. So don't be stressed out to find that right way. For, um, instead, you want to design a reasonable and meaningful experiment and conduct it. 
And the second is you want to use reliable measures of de a dependent variable. When I, say, when I say reliable measures, I want you to get multiple trials or, or multiple items. So for example, the sleep, uh, the cheese experiment, you don't want to just test them, test all the participants on one day. So that there are so many confounding variables that may contribute to the nine males in that one day. So you may want to test them on in a week or maybe in two weeks or maybe even in a month that you want to give them multiple trials. And the next is you want to do some pilot testing. Pilot testing is very, very important in experimental design. When you design an experiment, you want to try it out in a couple small samples, small participants to see if that experiment uh, really works out or not. And especially you want to do some manipulation check. If that manipulation check fails, you have to do it all over again. And if it's possible, you would like you want to do you may want to do a post experimental interview to figure out if there's anything else beyond your control that explains their behavior in the experiment. And the last thing and the most important thing in experiment is randomize. Randomize properly. So randomization is the key to the experiment. The randomize helps you to rule out or reduce the individual difference. So what I usually do is I use the random number generator. There's a very uh, easy function in Excel you can do. I use that to add um, assign my participants into different conditions. With that being said, that concludes my presentation. And any questions? All right, Sissy and Lori, I really thank you guys. Um, you know, I, I, I really love the way you guys um, proceeded with the webinar. It was really simple, and yet it was very informative. Um, I was uh, looking at the people who were joining the webinar, and I can tell you, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know there were people from Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, US, um, and uh, China and China as well. So um, just one thing I want to ask before I can look into the questions and that is, uh, would you be able to share your slides? Mm, yeah, that's fine. That's okay, okay. All right. So because somebody asked for the slides, so I can check. Uh, I, I just wanted to check with you. Um, all right. Now, um, guys, uh, those of you who are watching on Facebook, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments. Uh, because so far I haven't looked in, I haven't seen any questions other than people thanking you for saying that it's very informative and you guys have done a wonderful job. So I don't see any questions, which means normally for me, I say something that I, I don't want to say when nobody asks me questions. But um, I, I, I feel that uh, since there are no questions, I think it was pretty easy to understand and very basic. So... Um, all right, um, because there are no other questions and we have to keep it short, so I would um, think that we should just conclude the webinar. And then uh, one last thing is if there's any questions, is it okay uh, with you, Laurie and Cece, if people can direct their questions directly to you, like through an email or something? Yes, all right, perfect. So here, here we go. Um, guys, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to send an email to Lori and CC. Now, I know that both of them are very nice, but I also know that both of them are very busy. So if you do not get your answer right away, please just wait for them to get some time to answer your questions. Um, all right. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's one question. Um, I don't know who can answer this, but... Um, Murtaza Khan, he says, can we use G-Power to select sample size for other research designs? For Sam, maybe you can answer that question too. Right. Yes, yes right. I can answer this question. Uh, yes, Murtaza, you can definitely use G-Power to select sample size for your research designs. Now, please remember that G-Power is only going to give you an optimal sample size for the 
static statistical test that you are using so you can um, if let's say it gives you a sample size of 120 that would be the minimum sample size that is required to run that statistical test now you can obviously go beyond that sample size in g power uh, it gives you different uh, uh, groups of statistical tests like chi square uh, f test and stuff like this so you can um, uh, select sample size for regression based tests for ANOVA, MANOVA, t-test and stuff like this so yes to your question okay all right cc once again thank you very much Laurie. thank you very much uh, i really appreciate you taking your time and explaining all this stuff to all the people who are listening so with that um we would conclude this webinar thank you thank you very much thank you bye